Matt? What's that? Oh.
Let us settle into a spirit of worship, first with our prelude, Song Without Words, by Matthew Johnson. You are also invited to light a silent candle of joy or sorrow at this time. Words by Rebecca Savage for our chalice lighting this morning. We light our flaming chalice as a beloved people united in love and thirsting for restorative justice. May it melt away the tethers that uphold whiteness in our midst. May it spark in us a spirit of humility. May it ignite in us radical love that transforms our energy into purposeful action. This chalice of audacious hope, this chalice shines a light on our shared past, signaling our intention to listen deeply, reflect wisely, and move boldly toward our highest ideals.
Good morning. morning. There you go. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Worcester, congregation of love, hope, and justice, inspiring people to take on the challenges of a changing world. My name is Aaron Payson, and I am honored to be one of the ministers of this congregation. We begin by acknowledging that in Worcester, Massachusetts, we work learn, live, and worship on the seized ancestral homeland of the Nipmuc people who survive and remain active as the Nipmuc Nation. We offer a special welcome to those of you who are new or visiting with us for the first time this morning. We are delighted that you are here. We hope that you will join us in Fellowship Hall following the service for refreshments and conversation If you have questions or desire more information about this service or any of the ministries and programs of this congregation, please do not hesitate to ask. We invite you to fill out one of the cards found in the pews. These cards can be placed in the offering plate when it comes around or given to one of the ushers or greeters this morning. For those of you joining us online, we offer you a very special welcome for safety purposes and so that we might come to know you better as you're able please do list your name on your video feed please take a moment to sign one of the attendance clipboards as they are now being circulated though you are not obligated to sign we appreciate your information and will use it only for church purposes during the service we offer an opportunity to share a brief joy or sorrow If you would like yours to be read aloud by me, please print it on an index card found in the pew or drop it in and drop it into the collection plate when it comes around or bring it forward and hand it to to me um, at the time of joys and sorrows. These cards will also be posted outside the minister's office to be shared with people uh, in the coming weeks. For those online, you can place a joy or sorrow in the chat. Please proceed it by the words, please read so that we can find it quickly during this time of the service. In the foyer, there are listening devices and large print orders of uh, service and hymnals for those who might find uh, their assistant helpful. Uh, Please see one of our ushers who will be pleased to assist you. We invite you now to turn your personal technology to worship mode. And finally, please note the announcements on the back of your order of service this morning. There will be time for brief verbal announcements following the postlude. Um, Of our announcements today, please note that at noon today, we will be sponsoring our eighth principal workshop here in the sanctuary. Uh, For those who are coming in person, we'll join here just before noon for that workshop. And there will also be those who will join us online I hope that you will join us for this very special event and this very special moment in the history of this congregation as we take up uh, our call to address um, becoming a multicultural, anti-oppressive, anti-racist institution and hold ourselves accountable to that vision through our affirmation and promotion of the eighth principle. Yes. Oh, lest we forget, there will be a pizza break. So (laughs) let that be your motivation. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning and hope that this is an opportunity for rest and reflection and rejuvenation. Good morning. Our opening words by Monica Jacobson Tennyson, the heart of our faith. What is it that calls you here, that calls you onward, that calls you inward, that leads you homeward? What is it that gives you the power to make the change, to ask that question, to take that journey? 
What is it that says you have done well, that asks you to learn more, that brings you to stillness, that holds you up in hard times? It is relationship, the beating heart of our faith. It begins when we share this hour, our truths, this air, our hearts. Come, let us worship together. Would you please join together in our opening hymn found in your teal hymnals, number 1031, filled with loving kindness. be seated. Good morning, everybody. My name is Robin Mitzkovich. I am the Director of Religious Exploration and Education here at the church. I'm here to do a all church read moment. We've been talking about our all church read uh, for a while now, um, we're reading this book, Defund Fear, um, by Zach Norris. And there'll be opportunities to discuss this book on January 31st in the evening with the Side of Love team over Zoom. And also, we will be having a service based on the themes in this book, um, which is basically how incarceration affects families and the world. We also have 
books for middle school readers and children to grapple with these concepts as well. And I'm going to read from the author of Visiting Day, who is Jacqueline Woodson. Jacqueline says, when I was growing up, I had a favorite uncle, my mother's brother, Robert. And he was the best dancer in our family. He was funny and handsome and always came to our house with surprising gifts for me. A doll whose hair grew, a pair of skates, a new record that he'd teach me all the words to, a joke I could actually understand, all kinds of things. But my uncle Robert went to prison when I was very young. I never knew what his crime was and it really didn't matter. I knew I loved him dearly and that he loved me with the same ferocity. I knew that some of my happiness, my happiest moments in childhood were spent getting on that bus going to visit him, climbing off hours later and walking through many steel doors that led where my uncle was waiting. His hair was brushed, his uniform cleaned and pressed, his smile brighter than anything. As he laughed and talked with me and my family, I forgot for the moment where we were. I knew we were a family. I knew we were happy. I knew there was lots of love in the room. And on those trips home, I knew there was a sadness surrounding us and a hope that one day there wouldn't be prison walls, that one day my uncle would be free. And she says that although this book, Visiting Day, um, is based in fiction, she thought about her uncle the entire time that she wrote it. I hope you can get involved reading some of these books with us and um, join us for discussion after our service, also on um, February 5th. Thanks. So now is the time where we ask the kids in our community and youth to pick up their baskets and um, stand up and collect our change for change. Our chain, if you have change to drop in the basket this morning, please raise your hand and the kids will come find you. Um, this is the um, project that our children do to help with the emergency fund that the minister holds at the church. Let me thank you.
I invite all of those who wish to become members of this congregation to come forward at this time. Is that on? Yes. It's on. <laughs> Friends, we gather here this morning as an expression of our mutual quest towards personal and religious fulfillment. We gather secure in the knowledge that the truths we seek are not constrained by doctrine or dogma. We recognize that each is here for reasons known only to the individual heart and yet we gather in common fellowship to affect and sustain an atmosphere of mutual support. Here, we do not ask that you believe unquestioning that which is espoused by another's conscious convictions. We ask only that you follow faithfully that which your conscious dictates, mindful that in your searching, you will encounter other truths, other convictions, other faiths. Here you will be embraced as a member of a common family of seekers, all those past and present who have dedicated themselves to the tasks of nurture, compassion, and action, sympathetic to a common vision that no one person is an island unto themselves, but that we are all members of a larger family of life. What? The members and friends of the congregation, please rise and join together in our unison affirmation. We, the members and friends of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Worcester, welcome you to our church. We invite you to share our common concern for justice and righteousness, and our belief that through common efforts, we may better shape the meaning of our lives. We pledge to you our friendship and support as we strive to embody the common purposes that bring us here. Please be seated. This morning you have come forward of your own free will. Is it in this spirit of freedom, honoring your own religious values and respecting those who journey with you that you wish to join this liberal religious community? So it is. Then I invite you as a symbol of this commitment to add your name to our register and receive the gifts of fellowship offered here this morning. Just place your name and today's date, which is the 22nd. You do that. So we just welcome Ann, Ann Armstrong. Jeffrey Steinmetz. Dow. McDaniel, sorry. McDaniel. My apologies. Sharon. 
Shirley Trait. Chris Ryan. And Mary Ann Ryan. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, our newest members. The holy book hath hit the floor. I want to invite Denise Daregrand to come forward this morning and share with us a bit about Worcester Fellowship, which is the organization that is receiving our 50-50 uh, our uh, collection this morning. Good morning. As Aaron said, my name is Denise Daregrand. I'm a long-term, very long-term actually, congregant in this place, but I also work with a group, I'm president of the board, of a group called Worcester Fellowship. And what Worcester Fellowship has as its mission is very simple. It's to attend to the needs of the marginalized in our community. So the hungry, the homeless, those struggling with mental health issues, those struggling with substance abuse issues. And basically we do two things. Every Sunday, we hold a church service outside, rain or shine, outside of All Saints Church downtown. And our congregants come um, and we have a short service. We provide them with a bag lunch to go and basically provide a lot of fellowship. And then every Thursday we do a thing called Thursday Cafe where we invite them into the church. We serve them a hot meal, full hot meal, give them a bag lunch to go, give them all kinds of supplies that they might need and basically provide a sense of fellowship and support. So for a lot of our people, it's their couple hours a week where they can be out of the elements, where they can be in a safe, warm place and talk to people who share their experience. So one of the first people that I got to know at Worcester Fellowship is Larry, and I have been very privileged to be part of his journey. And I'm gonna ask Larry to come up and share a little bit about it with you. Hi, I'm Larry, and um, I'm very welcome to be here from Denise. I've come a long way. I wasn't homeless when I started going to Worcester Fellowship. I got addicted to alcohol and drugs, and my life started crumbling. Worcester Fellowship's always been there for me. They do have a church, which is outside on Sundays, which I'll be attending right after this. And on Thursdays, it's great. You can go to a warm place. You feel safe. Everybody's welcome there. Right now, I'm presently staying in a shelter at the Veterans, and I'm grateful for it, but I'm trying to cover my journey and move on. And I got it with Pastor Zach from our church and all the support from the staff there. Everybody's volunteering, and it's a blessing to have them. And I hope they keep continuing. They started off behind Worcester Common, and they got kind of bounced out of there. And now they're on Irving Street in Worcester, All Saints. It's a very place to mellow out and just get your feelings back to earth. And I appreciate being invited here. Thank you.
The challenge that we face as um, a church is that unlike most churches, we rely, you rely, on gifts and pledges from the congregants. We can't do that <laughs> because our people have nothing, virtually nothing. So we're providing them with whatever we can. So we rely as a group on the kindness and the generosity of groups in the community. We have churches that come in, cook us lunch, um, provide us with, lunch, with the uh, bag lunches, um, but we need funding to keep ourselves afloat. So anything that you can provide to help us continue to support these very needy and deserving people, we would greatly appreciate. Thank you. The Worcester Fellowship for me epitomizes the, the integrity and the vision of what it means to belong to religious community in Worcester. Not that there are separate congregations, um, but that we are all involved in the same mission, which is to befriend and to craft beloved community wherever we are and to strive to meet the needs of those who have been marginalized and bring them into the center and remind them of the good gift that they are. And so I am forever grateful to Denise, for my colleague, Zach Kersey, for all of those who serve in the Worcester uh, Fellowship missions and ministry. Uh, and uh, in the coming months, hope that we can draw closer uh, to this effort. I know that many congregations participate by creating lunch that is served on Sunday afternoon following their service on uh, the, uh, over at uh, All Saints. And so um, we will um, hope to join uh, that cadre uh, of um, our friends from across the city in that effort as well. So this morning, um, our 50-50 collection will be taken in a moment. Uh, offered in a moment, and uh, if you would like to contribute to the 50-50 portion of this service and you're writing a check, just please put 50-50 in the memo line. Um, if you're using uh, cash, uh, uh, that is not a pledge. So if your check is a pledge or your cash is a pledge, please mark it as such so that it gets counted accordingly. Otherwise, that which is collected will be split between the congregation and Worcester Fellowship this morning. We hope that this inspires generosity. At this time, our morning offering and 50-50 collection will be received. We come to that 
time in our service when we're given pause to consider what is deepest in our hearts or most profoundly on our minds, or in the work of our hands and the days that have transpired, or in the prospect of days to come. Joys and sorrows that touch us deeply and are given another measure of meaning because of our capacity to share them in the midst of a company that claims us as a co-journeyer. So I invite those of you who have joys or sorrows this day to come forward and form lines on either side of the sanctuary to come and speak briefly into the microphone telling us first who you are. So that those using our automated um, auditory uh, devices or who are joining us online can also participate in this important ritual. And then to light a candle if you so desire. Are there joys or sorrows to be shared this day? Hi everyone, I'm uh, Ann Armstrong. I've got a, a couple joys and a sorrow. Well, my first joy is that I, um, I'm really happy to have found this community and um, excited to be a member. Uh, my second, I'm gonna sandwich it. So my concern is for my friend, Mark McMullen Bushman, who lives in Denver, Colorado, and um, just had an operation for thyroid cancer and has just had a lot of health problems over the last five years or so. Diabetes, diagnosed with diabetes too, and um, diverticulitis, so just, you know, thoughts with him and his family of three little girls and uh, his wife, who's also one of my best friends, so this for Mark. Um, and then my third, the other joy, is um, I am relatively new to the Worcester area. I work at Worcester State University, but I just, over the last, um, over the last two weeks, the community who's invested in pollinator gardens has sort of like blocked to my door. And I'm just so grateful and so excited for all of these new pollinator garden opportunities in the town of Oxford and the greater Worcester community. And it's just a very vibrant time and place. So thanks. Those are my joys. And you've noted her name for garden on team here, right? <laughs> Got it? Okay. Don't all swarm her at once. I mean, it is a pollinator, but just, okay, good. Good morning. My name's Maura. And I raised my children in this church, and um, I was a member here before I had children. And you know, so the funny thing is, all of a sudden, I realized it's almost February, and I went, holy mackerel, January went really fast. Wait, my kids are both in college. That went so fast. And one has been home still until the end of next week. One's been back for two weeks, and his first year of college is going so well, and he's so excited, and I am just relieved and grateful to this community and happy for these human beings that I had something to do with pollinating and <laughs> watering and feeding. Um, and you know that sending song where we say, go now in peace, go now in peace. And as my kids were little and then bigger and then running off, go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere everywhere you may go but go i would think but go hi my name is paul and i wanted to share a joy and a joy was that um was it back in was it 1997 i gave up drinking on january 1st and then i celebrated haven't had a, had a, a libation since. So I'm still crazy, but that's okay. And the sorrow that I have is that uh, I had an opportunity to visit my brother yesterday, and he's dealing with COVID now, and they had me dress up in all these things. And, and I went in there because I had to do some business transactions. He didn't recognize me. Like, hmm, you know. So um, that's not my brother. That's not my brother. You know, like, and it's, it was so, um, it, it spiritually punched me, you know, because, you know, I was helping him out quite a bit. And it just like, you know, you, you, well, you know what it is. Hi, I'm Chloe Hannon. Um, I am a uh, preschool teacher. 
at a school attached to a very, very large known city and state um, establishment. And um, my joy today is that after lots of back and forth with our um, employer and lots of headache and upset, we have won a contract for compensation that is more in line with the hard, impactful work we do. Um, and I also want to say, if you are a teacher or you know a teacher, um, make sure they know they're doing a good job because it's January and we need to hear that. <laughs> Who are our teachers? Stand, stand up. Who are our teachers? There we go. Excellent. Kim Napoleone writes, please send prayers to the family of Carol uh, Schofield. Uh, she was a dear friend to my mom, Sharon. And um, and I and me and she passed away on Saturday, January fourteenth. She was only seventy-five. And the other uh, sad news this morning for those of you who remember her, Gail Eckerson, longtime member of this congregation, died this week um, following um, a lengthy um, chronic illness. Um, she was. Um, accompanied uh, through this process by her niece. I have been in conversation and, and also uh, myself and June Davenport, who was very, very close to her. So heart and love go out to all of the members of her family and to her friends who remember her so fondly. Um, arrangements are still in process as to when there will be an opportunity to honor and celebrate her life, and we'll certainly let you know that as soon as we know as well. Are there other joys or sorrows on Facebook or on a Zoom? There, there's one on Zoom. Uh, Bernadette Nelson writes, please read, sorrow, I'm struggling with chronic pain issues. Joy, I'm grateful for Denise Daragrand and others like her in this community who help others in need. Great, thank you. The other uh, that, uh, no, I, I've just said that. So let's be in the spirit of prayer and meditation. Spirit of life, we ask for your deep and abiding presence this day. As we call into our mind and hearts those who seek health and wholeness as we offer an embrace that reminds those who mourn that they are not alone, as we cherish and cheer the work of our educators, and so many others in our community, we who would seek a more just world find ourselves in this moment midst a company of justice seekers. Let us be energized and humbled by that. For the journey is long, but the company is amazing. Remind us of the legacy that we are, of generations that have come before, and the joy that we are for those generations yet becoming and to follow. For this is our responsibility to craft a way of being that is remembered one day as exquisite. Amen. And blessed be.
Elizabeth Shively, a New Testament professor at St. Andrews in Scotland, reminds us that in the Gospel of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, not, not the Sermon on the Amount, that comes in a couple of weeks when we start our stewardship drive, but, but the Sermon on the Mount is placed for the authors of Matthew at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, emphasizing that Jesus was the authoritative teacher of the divine's people. Jesus, she writes, breaks into the public arena, proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near, echoing the words of his cousin, John the Baptist. He calls his first disciples from the task of fishing for fish to the task of fishing for people, and then shows his disciples what this new kind of fishing looks like by preaching the good news of the kingdom of heaven to people and manifesting its power by healing every kind of dis-ease and affliction. The presence of this kingdom liberates, she writes, and then Jesus climbs a mountain with a crowd he has so excited, and he sits down in a pasture, in the posture of a teacher, encircled by his newly called disciples, and they being the primary targets of his instruction, but not the only targets, I add, in the principles of life and in the kingdom of heaven. His words are familiar. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I, I trust for most of us, those are not words you have just heard for the first time. They're the kind of words that have a much larger life than the scripture in Matthew. They have taken on meaning as they have been repeated by generations of people both inside and outside the Christian church. But what if we got it wrong? What if the words that are so familiar to us were different in critical ways that we have yet to understand? The authors of a new book called After Jesus and Before Christianity, 
which I strongly recommend and highly recommend for those of you who are interested in this kind of thing. We're doing an ongoing series right now among ecumenical congregations in the Greendale Ecumenical Group studying this material. It's the kind of stuff that, you know, the three ministers, uh, Mark Nielsen, Andrew Borden, and myself, you know, um, we, we can go down this rabbit hole anytime and spend all kind, you know what I'm talking about, Deb, right? You get together with professors around a topic and it doesn't really matter whether you intended to study it that way, it just goes, right? And it goes. Um, But they write about a turn of phrase. The book says, in a hallmark of the lives of the, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, the lives of the people who became, and I love this, they, they argue that there is no, really, the idea of a Christianity is wrong, wrong-headed. Actually, that there were no Christianities in the very earliest church. People were belonged to the party of the anointed. I love that, right? And there were plenty of parties, right? It wasn't just one party of the anointed, plenty of different communities that were trying to figure this out. And that's part of what the scholarship around the early Christian community is beginning to discover is that there's no such thing as one tradition. There are lots of traditions, but they continue <clears throat> Another hallmark of this set of groups was the empire of God, traditionally translated as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. When we lean toward the comic, ironic, and sociopolitical translation, empire of God, say the offers, because it captures the irony and the opposition of this God reality to the violence of empire the empire of Rome. It reminds us that when speaking of the empire of God, the empire of Rome is directly challenged. Moreover, the Greek word is the same in both cases, kingdom and empire. Stories and images about the empire of God built upon small events in daily life, not long speeches about power and might, nor about the nature of God. Parables about the realm of the empire of God were experiential snapshots, not theological dissertations or moral aphorisms. Empire of God, used as often as good news, compared God's action to what happened in the ordinary field, the market, and the house. So we need to reimagine this gathering on the hillside. Many of you haven't imagined it since you were in Sunday school as small children. So let's just take a moment, shall we? With words that are spoken and received in such compassionate spirit, words that have provided comfort to those who have been forced to live on the margins of their communities. These are the people that are sitting on the hillside those that have been subjugated by the powers and principalities of control and domination, words that have been spoken comfort to those who mourn, those whose lives are marred by the pangs of severe want, those who are consistently harassed by civil and religious authorities, words that speak of the spirit and power that has been gifted by the force of creation itself, and therefore, cannot be taken away, are also words, are also words that simultaneously critique the very powers that dominate and subjugate, marginalize and terrorize. One can imagine the scene, serene as we have imagined it our entire lives with people sitting among the grass and the rocks and the hillside listening comforted and comforting those around them and behind them. Standing guard are those who are suspicious of such a spontaneous gathering. Those who wonder what kind of protest will arise from such a crowd. They stand with weapons at the ready, 
just in case things get out of hand? What if the words of comfort and compassion that are so very familiar to us were heard differently by those who were bruising for a fight? For these people, Jesus' words are the epitome of the critical nature of compassion. In the very same words that speak comfort and solace to those who suffer at the hands of empire, those who serve such power hear one who assaults the very nature of that power and castigates it, and castigates its ends by means of a prayerful reminder that what those who guard serve is but a minuscule force in the face of the love and the life offered to those who dwell in the spirit of creation itself, the empire of God, the empire of heaven. If we return for a moment to the words that we heard last week when we honored the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we catch a glimpse of this kind of doublespeak, if you will, doublespeak of compassion and critique as he spoke to a crowd gathered at the Holt Street Baptist Church in Montgomery days after the arrest of Rosa Parks. He said, and certainly, certainly this is the glory of America with all its faults. This is the glory of our democracy. If we are incarcerated behind iron curtains of a communistic nature, a nation, we couldn't do this. If we were dropped in the dungeon of a totalitarian regime, we couldn't do this. But the great glory of American democracy is the right to protest. My friends, don't let anybody make us feel that we are to be compared in our actions with the Ku Klux Klan or with the White Citizens Council. There's no crosses burned at any bus stops in Montgomery. There will be no white persons pulled out of their homes and taken on some distant road and lynched for cooperating. There will be nobody amid among us who will stand up and defy the constitution of this nation. We only assemble here because of our desire to see right exist. My friends, we want to be known that we are going to work with grim and bold determination to gain justice on the buses of this city. And we're not wrong. If we were wrong in what we were, <clears throat> we are not wrong in what we're doing. If we were wrong, the Supreme Court of this nation is wrong. If we're wrong, the Constitution of the United States is wrong. If we're wrong, God Almighty is wrong. If we're wrong, Jesus of Nazareth was near, merely a utopian dreamer that never came down to earth. If we're wrong, justice is a lie, it has no meaning, and we are determined here in Montgomery to work and fight until justice runs down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Double speak, because you know that that gathering was not just of the faithful. There were police, there were probably federal agents, there were people that belonged to the Ku Klux Klan and the White Citizens Council that either infiltrated that meeting or surrounded it. And in Montgomery, Alabama, in 110 degree heat, the windows were open. And there was a very loud sound system People heard what King said for blocks. And if we think for a moment that he was just speaking to people in the room, then we forget half the audience that he was attempting to address. Just like reimagining that hillside in Galilee. What do you think those folks heard? Reminders, perhaps, of all of the ways in which what was transpiring in Montgomery were actually in line with the vision of the way in which democracy itself was supposed to function. A way of reminding those who rely on violence in order to perpetuate power were involved in an illegitimate endeavor, if ever there was one. 
and to inspire people to remember that they belong to something far greater than the powers that seek to control them in their own context. This morning, I wonder if the, the principle that we're considering this afternoon in our workshop serves a similar purpose to speak words of justice and accountability to those who claim to belong to this congregation, as well as those who would cast dispersions on our attempt to be beloved community. That principle that we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. To affirm and promote this principle is to commit oneself to being part of a larger effort to realize the often elusive vision of community that we have long claimed we want to be. Moreover, for those who are threatened by the very notion of such an expansive vision of being, these words critique the very nature of oppression and empire itself. While the vision calls us to account for our efforts to continue to make real beloved community, it also chastens those who place uh, those, uh, it also chastens those places in our community and our commonwealth and our country where such efforts are opposed. This morning, let us hear both the call to a deeper, more just and compassionate community and the critique of a world that is often deaf to the cry of love, hope, and justice. That is our call, to listen beyond words and hear the way it is communicated across expanses that we have often forgotten existed to begin with. And attend to them both with courage, with love, with hope, and with justice. Amen. And blessed be. So, would you join in our litany this morning? And um, you have a very, very difficult part. One line. And that line is, I am with you in this. Can you just say that? You don't even have to look at your order of service, right? Just say the phrase with me, I am with you in this. Excellent. When I point to you, will you say that phrase back to me? Right? Let's try it. Good. To the refugee family seeking a safe place for their children's dreams, say. To the trans teenager longing for a world that accepts them for who they are, say. To the black parents wondering when will the lives of their children truly matter, say. To the lonely, the frightened, the dispossessed, say. To the bullied, the battered, the broken down, say. To the hungry and the homeless, to the silenced and the shamed, to the weary and the worried, say. To all those for whom your disheveled heart is aching, say. Amen. Would you please join together in our closing hymn this morning? Number 1053 in your teal hymnals. Please rise in body or in spirit. Could anyone ever tell you you were in?
anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're affected to a soul. Could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle how deeply you're connected to my soul my colleague and my friend steve crump writes that which is worthy of doing, create with your hands. That which is worthy of repeating, speak with a clear voice. That which is worthy of remembering, hold in your hearts. And that which is worthy of living, go and live now. Amen. Instead of what was originally planned uh, as the postlude, um, uh, given uh, David uh, Crosby's death, um, we're going. The choir is going to perform "Turn, Turn, Turn," and you are welcome to sing along. Please be seated. For those of you who are about to have a flashback, please remember that you're in a safe space. Reach out to the people around you, it'll be okay, I promise.
Are there any uh, short announcements this morning? I want to uh, remind you that we'll gather back here at, uh, just before noon to settle in for our eighth principal workshop. Uh, for those of you who have signed up online, please note that it is a different Zoom uh, link than the one for this service. We hope to see you all back here very, very soon. Once again, beloved worship in this place has come to an end. Our service continues, however, next with an opportunity for refreshment and conversation. What, Paul? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yes. Thanks.